everyone. I'm Jenny Rushlow. I'm the Associate Dean for Environmental Programs at Vermont Law School. And we have an awesome panel lined up for the end of the day. So I hope that you've gotten your sugar rush or your caffeine jolt or whatever you will need to get you through to the end of the day, because this is, this is going to be a good one. Um, so I am a recent recruit to academia, having come from legal practice very recently, where it was all about figuring out how to take the ideas for how you wanted to change the world and turn them into legal theories that you could, that you could use and turn into policy or turn into litigation. And so it's from that background that I'm particularly excited about moderating this panel, which is going to be about just that. This is an impressive lineup of practitioners and thinkers that can answer the big question of what comes next. How do we take these transformative ideas and find a way to turn them into implementation and um, work through the sometimes slow and incremental process that we often find in the legal world? Our panelists are going to focus on rights of nature language in ordinances, litigation, the role of animal law, and the next frontier of outer space law. Our first speaker is Thomas Lindsay, from the executive, who is the executive director of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And he's going to be giving an overview of the recent history of developing rights of nature ordinances in the United States, and an update on recent litigation, as well as some remarks about the building of this rights of nature movement. Next, we'll hear from Kevin Schneider, who's the executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project. And he'll talk about the law and policy work of his organization, looking into the legal personhood and rights for non-human animals. Third, we'll hear from Linda Sheehan, who is the senior counsel at the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation and former executive director of the Earth Law Center. And Linda will be discussing practical steps for implementation, specifically developing standards that support implementation of rights of nature laws, um, with a particular example from Santa Monica, California. And finally, we'll hear from our own Vermont Law School professor, Reed Loader. And she'll be talking about the next frontier, the concept of an outer space ethic, which is critical given that recent laws are allowing companies to commercially mine celestial bodies, which came as a shock to me, I will admit. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Thomas to kick us off. So uh, I think I was included on the panel today to talk about what happens when the shit hits the fan. <laughs> when uh, you actually try to enforce this stuff uh, in the United States. And I also wanted to try with the time that I have to give folks some color and some depth about what's happening in the United States today around what we call community rights organizing. But I wanted to start uh, back in law school, uh, in law school my third year, and I went to Widener University Law School in Pennsylvania. We were approached by a bunch of folks from rural communities across the state who were faced with frac, uh, fracking or frac wastewater injection wells or toxic waste incinerators or hog factory farms, you know, the thousands of different single issues that communities are faced with every day. And they came to us and they said, we need help. And we said, well, why don't you go to an environmental lawyer and get some help? And they said, well, we can't afford it. And we said, well, there's nothing we can do for you because we haven't passed the bar yet. It would be illegal to practice. And they said, why don't you teach us how to practice law? And we said, how much time do you have? And uh, we started actually training community activists in law libraries and to give oral arguments and to write briefs with an understanding that when environmental lawyers come into a community, we leave. We assist and, and do the job that we can and represent the communities, but then we're gone. It's like a, a casket of knowledge that we take with us. And so back then, uh, in law school, we decided to train community activists. And to our surprise, perhaps, they went into courts and started winning on things like uh, zoning hearing board appeals and permit appeals and those types of things. And after we graduated from law school, we decided to form the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund to actually assist more people to do that kind of stuff, uh, how to be their own lawyers, but also how to represent these communities in battles with some of the largest corporations operating in the states. And for about 15 years, we practiced conventional environmental law. We did the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act. If it had an acronym, we litigated it. 
And in law school, we're led to believe that the United States has the best environmental laws in the world. In fact, they're so good that we export them out to other countries. We send our folks out to export them to other countries. But what you find when you actually try to apply those environmental laws in different situations is that they're not really about stopping anything. They're not about stopping anything. They're about getting a better factory farm or a frack operation with less adverse impacts. But they have absolutely nothing to do with the community that's impacted by the project having the legal authority to say no to the project coming in. It doesn't exist in the United States. And when we give talks to community groups, they say, well, of course it exists. Communities have the power to say no to these harmful things coming into the community. And the answer is that they don't. Under the system of law today, if a corporation has a state permit or a federal permit to carry out a project in your community, your community lacks the legal authority to say no to that project coming into the community. Lacks the legal authority. If you attempt to do it, if you attempt to ban a factory farm or ban a frack injection wastewater well in your community, what happens is you get sued. And you get sued by the corporation that's the permittee for the project to be put into the community. And the corporations over the past 100 years have perfected the authority of overriding any local municipal authority that you think that you have to actually stop the project from coming in. So we gave up on environmental law. I hate to say that at Vermont Law School, but we gave up on environmental law. We turned our back on environmental law and we decided to do something different. Because even though we were winning permit appeal cases and going into courts and winning these various holding actions to delay certain projects from coming into the community, eventually the corporation would come back, they'd fix their permit application, they would fill in the hole or the gap or the deficiency that we had found in the permit application in the first place, and the corporation would drive the project or facility into the community. We weren't stopping shit for 15 years. Uh, and I think that uh, frustration with existing environmental law is one of the reasons why the rights of nature stuff and the community rights movement has been taking hold in the United States. So what did we start with first in 2001? Well, it was communities that were getting factory hog farms, so 15,000 head, 30,000 head hog factory farms in South Central Pennsylvania. They were coming to us for help, and they said to us, well, we don't want these things, and we said, uh, philosophically, we're with you, we wouldn't want them either, because if I'm in your community, I don't want a 15,000 head hog factory farm next to my house. And they said, what can we do? And we said, well, under conventional law, you can't do anything. Because the facility's been permitted, you got to accept them. You might be able to shave off a couple of the rough edges, but that's about it. And they said, well, we don't like conventional law <laughs> for that reason. And we said, well, we don't like it either, so why don't we do something different? And so one community of 400 people in South Central Pennsylvania passed a ban on corporate farms, a ban on corporate factory farming within their community. And about two weeks later, another community passed a ban, and then another community passed a ban. Pretty soon, 20 communities in Pennsylvania had passed bans on factory farms within their community. And uh, folks started coming to us saying, well, if you can do it with factory farms, what about land applied sewage sludge, which is a big issue in Pennsylvania? And what about fracking and frack wastewater injection wells? And so over a 10-year period, we helped to assist 200 communities in 10 states uh, to actually move forward in what's become known as a, the community rights movement to begin to expand municipal law out to recognize the authority of these communities to veto or ban harmful projects coming into their municipality. Our biggest uh, client is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, they banned uh, fracking uh, within the city of Pittsburgh and uh, in the process recognized the rights of rivers that ran through the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and so the, the first, you know, moving beyond the community rights, municipal rights stuff for a moment, but seeing it as a portal for the rights of nature work is that in a small community uh, called Tamaqua, Tamaqua Borough, uh, just north uh, west of Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, they had an issue with a corporation and the state bringing in PCB-laden dredge from the Delaware River, which was being dredged, and dumping it in old mine sites in the community of Tamaqua. So, hey, we have these old deep mine holes in the community of Tamaqua that were left over from 50 years of mining in the community. Let's use it, hey, here's a good idea, let's use it uh, to take the dredge that's coming up from the Delaware River that's contaminated with PCBs and let's dump it in those mine holes and then let's seal it up forever into perpetuity. 
folks in the community, including the fishermen, fisher folks that used the Little Schuylkill River that ran through the community of Tamaqua, said, wait a minute, if we put the dredge in there and it's in perpetuity, it's eventually going to contaminate the river that we use for fishing and recreation and all kinds of other things. And they said, maybe we should develop a new model for environmental protection because we know exactly what's going to happen if this stuff comes into our community and we allow that to happen. The, the borough of Tamaqua, the city council, the mayor, faced with this issue in their community, became the first community in the world in 2006 to adopt a local ordinance that declared that nature and ecosystems within their community had the right to exist, thrive, and prosper. That was the standard that they used in the borough of Tamaqua. It was the borough of Tamaqua's work that began uh, to lead other communities within Pennsylvania to experiment with this rights of nature approach. And it was Tamaqua and those other communities in Pennsylvania that led to us being invited down to speak to the Ecuadorian Constituent Assembly as they were working on language to draft for the new Ecuadorian Constitution. And it was our privilege to do that uh, and to tell stories about what was, what was happening in these very rural communities in Pennsylvania uh, around this community rights movement and the rights of nature uh, happening in that place. Uh, today, uh, what's interesting about the Ecuadorian work is that its ramifications outside of Ecuador have been almost as powerful as the stuff that's happened in Ecuador. Uh, outside of Ecuador, uh, the work on rights of nature in the United States, at least, began to spread to 10 states in the United States, uh, where about 30 communities now across those 10 states have adopted rights of nature ordinances. So local laws dealing with rights of nature, uh, recognizing rights for nature, nature not being property within those communities. Just like with Tamaqua Borough, they all spring from real life confrontations confrontations between communities who have been told under this system of law that we have in the United States that you have no authority to stop the harmful project that's coming into your community, uh, and the need for a new system of law that not only recognizes their ability to say no to those things coming in, but extends these legal protections and recognizes legal protections for uh, the rights of nature. What folks don't generally understand about the legal system that we have, even though we talk in esoteric terms about a Western system of law and the need for something else, is that the system of law that we have today in the United States is, is based entirely on property protection. It's about constitutional protections wrapped around property. So when you have, let's say, a frack wastewater injection well coming into a community proposed by a corporation, and the community says, we don't want that here. Our vision of a sustainable community doesn't include it. And they adopt a local law that bans it, uh, or a rights of nature law that bans it by creating rights for ecosystems within the community through which fracking and frack wastewater injection well can't be carried out, that it buys a lawsuit from the system. And the lawsuit is by a corporation, usually the permittee, who will sue the community. The lawsuit is a constitutional civil rights lawsuit under the law. So the corporation comes in and says to the municipality and the community, you can't pass that, you're violating our constitutional rights when you adopt that within the municipality. Primarily, they use the Commerce Clause in the Constitution, saying we have a right to engage in interstate commerce and what you're doing, because energy production is part of interstate commerce, that it's unlawful and unconstitutional for you to violate our Commerce Clause rights. So that's a piece of it. And the second piece is this old favorite tune, the Fifth Amendment Takings Clause, which says that if you hold a permit, and that permit that you hold as a corporation is a piece of property under the law. And we don't usually think about it that way. But if you have a permit, it's actually property. It has a property interest. That the community, when they pass a law banning the project, is actually taking the property of the corporation. It's taking the permit, and it's taking future lost profits that can be made as a result of that permit becoming active. So there's a takings claim that's brought against the community. In addition to those constitutional claims, there's also stuff called preemption, uh, which usually the state government has put into place preemptive laws. The community can be sued for violating preemption, i.e., you don't have the authority to pass the thing in the first place. And a little thing's called Dillon's Rule in the United States, which is the municipality is a child, the parent is the state, and the municipality can't do anything that the state has, uh, has not told it that it can do 
So in other words, if the state has an authorized municipality to pass X, uh, the municipality automatically doesn't have the authority to pass X. What's the damage claim that's usually made by the corporation? Well, if you violate the constitutional rights of the corporation, they have resort under the civil rights laws in the United States to sue you for damages. Damages as a result of the passage of the ordinance, which is usually the amount of lost natural gas, for example, underneath the township or the municipality. So the damage award can be in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, facing off against the corporation, in addition to attorney's fees under the law, which they're also allowed to obtain. So we, we, you know, we talk about nature as a slave, and that was mentioned earlier, but our communities are enslaved because we can be forced to host these projects no matter what the harm is to the community as long as they're permitted by the state or federal government. That's the rule of law in the United States. So the reason why this is relevant to rights of nature stuff is that, and this, is, this should come as no surprise to people in this room, the US Constitution has no rights of nature provisions in it, right? State constitutions have no rights of nature provisions in them. If rights of nature is going to become a reality in the United States, legally binding rights for ecosystems, it's got to be done at the municipal level. It's got to be done in cities, towns, villages, counties. It's the only place left to do anything of this nature because we're not powerful enough to do shit at those other levels of government. When you work at the municipal level, you have to enlarge the portal of municipal authority. Because in the United States, the corporations and other business entities have actually narrowed down that portal so that municipalities can't really pass anything at all. The constitutional doctrine that we've developed to actually <laughs> attempt to provide a shelf for those rights of nature ordinances to go through a portal is that people have a, a constitutional right to local community self-government. That's the argument that we present to judges. We argue to the judge that the people of the community have the authority and the right to actually be able to adopt rights of nature ordinances within their municipalities. And given that judges in the United States do not move as quickly sometimes as judges in Colombia or in India or some of these other places that we've looked at, that our folks in states like New Hampshire next door, uh, where communities have done community rights lawmaking and passed rights of nature ordinances, because yes, next door in New Hampshire, you have about a dozen communities that have passed rights of nature laws uh, in the state that those folks have come together to form state-based community rights networks who are now proposing state constitutional amendments that would legalize the adoption of rights of nature ordinances within municipalities in, for example, New Hampshire. Amazingly enough, last year, one of those constitutional amendments made it to the floor of the House, received a third of the vote of the House of Representatives. So a third of the House of Representatives in, I'll repeat that, in New Hampshire, uh, voted to actually create the ability to pass rights of nature laws at the municipal level. That's pretty astounding, astounding to us. Now, to more of the specifics, the rights of nature laws in the United States have basically, at this point, not been enforced. And that's generally because the municipality gets sued first. So in a community like a little place called Grant Township in Western Pennsylvania, uh, you have a situation uh, in which the corporation has come in and sued the municipality. Uh, in those cases, nature has to intervene in the case. So the corporation sues the municipal corporation, the city, town, village, or county, and nature has to intervene in the case. The ecosystem that's affected by the project has to intervene in the case. There have been several, and I'm gonna go very quickly because I'm almost out of time. Uh, one was in a little place called Grant Township. The uh, case was PGE versus Grant Township. The intervener was the Little Mahoning River Watershed. Uh, so we represented the watershed as an intervener in the case. That case eventually went up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, in a place called Highland Township next door, uh, the Crystal Spring watershed was an intervening ecosystem. And the case is Seneca Resources Corporation versus Highland Township. And finally, the last two. Uh, one is in Lincoln County, Oregon, where they banned aerial pesticide spraying. A corporation came in and sued the municipality. Uh, the Siletz River uh, became the next friend ecosystem to attempt to intervene in the litigation. And the final case, which takes us out of intervention and into this broad scope stuff, uh, was the one that excited so many people last year, the Colorado River Ecosystem versus State of Colorado case. 
I could talk more about that during the questions, but it was an attempt to bring a rights of nature case directly under federal constitutional guarantees. So using the 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment uh, to actually bring a case to declare that the river was a person uh, against the state of Colorado. Uh, I think that's it, time-wise. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And next we're gonna hear from Kevin Schneider, who's executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project. Okay, thank you. All right, hi everybody. Thanks for sticking in, and I hope that uh, you've gotten as much, maybe I'll just fix this a little bit, gotten as much out of uh, today as I have. So as you can probably guess from uh, from what you see before you, um, we're a little bit different. Uh, so we don't bring nature rights cases as such. Uh, rather, um, as our title, the Non-Human Rights Project might suggest, all of our clients are non-human animals. Uh, so to give a brief uh, background of how I came into this, I've been involved with uh, the organization for almost 10 years, uh, and it was really my inspiration to go to law school. So I think probably a lot of folks in the uh, you know, certainly at, at, this, at this school can, can identify with, you know, picking a passion really early and sticking to it. Uh, so if, if you are doing that and, and sometimes wondering, you know, is it possible to, to actually do this? I, I hope that I'm, you know, living proof that it is. And I also, I couldn't help but laugh, uh, you know, this is called the applied law panel. I, I think somewhere it said practical law. But as an animal rights attorney, I can assure you this is the first time I've been labeled as practical. So I think that's a sign of almost progress in and itself. Um, and actually, Thomas's talk was, was um, well, really all the talks today, I think, have provided uh, you know, fodder and certainly reminded me of uh, aspects of my own work. But you know, this, this notion that, um, that we're somehow powerless, right? That, that um, it's certainly something I can identify with. It's what got me to, to the point where I am now, really. It was 10 years ago. Uh, you know, For me, it was this recognition that we have this massive food system, billions of animals that are really faceless. Um, they have no, really no legal protections whatsoever. And you know, taking that forward, it, it, it just became so clear to me that uh, it's so fundamentally unjust to have a world where literally uh, your species is your determining factor for whether or not you can have a single right at all. Uh, because as we know, it's, it hasn't always been, but we're now roughly at a point where being a human being is enough to entitle you to rights. It wasn't always the case. Um, so we are now at a point where uh, we are finally, after hundreds of years of civil rights work, taken um, all human beings to the, to the status of rights holders. And this, this goes back to a, to a term that we've heard a lot today, uh, personhood, things and persons. And it's a, it's a crude, and I think for most of us, it doesn't really comport with our ideas of reality, right? We don't really separate things out so neatly. This is a thing, this is a person. But as much as we, uh, certainly in the Western you know, common law tradition, want to maybe sneak away from that conclusion, the fact of the matter is, is that we're stuck with these two categories. We have things and we have persons. And uh, you know, as, as has been alluded to today, it really wasn't that long ago in, you know, in historical terms that there were many, many human beings who were considered to be legal things. And that you know, really kind of segues into you know, how do you take all of these ideas, the, the philosophical underpinnings that we've been talking about, things that really do resonate with more and more people, how do we give that uh, a legal life? How do we take that before a judge and you know, actually initiate a real legal proceeding. Uh, so for us, it started with like a good common law lawyer looking at history. And there are um, really reams of, 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 uh, of cases where um, beginning in the 18th century, uh, anti-slavery um, uh, you know, campaigners would uh, you know, make all kinds of efforts to, to present the reality of the awfulness of slavery to the public, to, to the parliament, but it by and large fell on deaf ears. It wasn't until 
there was a lawsuit filed uh, in the famous Somerset case. It was actually a habeas corpus petition brought on behalf of a slave. And so the judge in that case, this very famous judge, Lord, Lord Mansfield, was faced with this really monumental question of, I have before me what is so obviously a human being, living, breathing, thoughts, emotions, feelings, but in terms of the law, I'm looking at a thing. And so it took, um, you know, really, it obviously wasn't a, uh, an easy process, right? Um, and there's a lot of writing, really interesting writing, um, including by my boss, Steve Wise. Some of you might know he wrote a whole book about this called Though the Heavens May Fall. And, you know, it illustrates really how, in one way, we can use the tools that this system that we really justifiably have so many problems with, particularly in the context of the issues that we've been discussing today. But there is still a lot of room and a lot of power to utilizing those concepts and arguments that the courts deem themselves deem important. And so what does that mean in practice, right? We file our lawsuits on behalf of, again, non-human animals. We've started with uh, chimpanzees. We have lawsuits on behalf of elephants. Uh, I can talk a little bit about how we decided on those species, but the underlying arguments really from species to species remain very much um, very similar. And the, the same question comes up, is this a thing or is this a person? And you know, the problem is that while we have, uh, for animals specifically, we have various welfare laws, we have certainly sentimental feelings, many of us about animals, uh, at least dogs and cats, but the legal reality is that as long as you meet very, you know, very bare minimum welfare requirements, in many states, most states, it's perfectly legal to, for example, keep an elephant completely alone. Or in, as in our, some of our cases, in upstate New York, we found a couple of chimpanzees essentially living on trailer lots. So we have uh, here a situation where the legal system is still wearing you know, almost a pre-Darwinian uh, you know, hat, if you will. And there's as so much, I think, uh, as, as we know, as in working in the environmental field, it, it often becomes a battle over science, right? Uh, and trying to force this recognition, whether it's climate science or for us, the science of the cognition of these animals. So to get a little bit into how we apply this law, um, Habeas corpus, we see this as the first important thing is it's a road to the common law. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that concept. It's uh, as opposed to acts of the legislature or executive orders, this is the law that judges make, right? And it used to be um, certainly before um, the founding of this country, but even in the early days of this country, that was the predominant path of rulemaking of how disputes were settled. Of course, you know, societies become more complex over time. Um, you know, legislation crowds out or preempts various areas. But the fact remains that, uh, at least in the United States and you know, other common law countries, you still have this ability to tap into the common law. And so there's a lot of talk about, you know, well, do judges have too much power? Uh, should this even be something that is put to one person or a panel of individuals, such a momentous question? I think we can debate that. I think that certainly recent events make pretty clear that our Supreme Court is perhaps too monumental, too important, uh, too, too, uh, has too much power, right? But we can still look at the, the tools that have been around for hundreds of years that we have and try to put them to work for what we think is a good purpose. Uh, in our cases, it's literally taking, say, a captive chimpanzee, a captive elephant, from a really sad situation of essentially solitary confinement, having them be declared a legal person with, and that does not mean that you suddenly get the full suite of rights, right? Um, that really just means being a legal person, we often use the example, is, is really just like a cup. It's never been a biological thing, that's why it's always made sense uh, kind of under the logic of the common law to have corporations be persons. But indeed, as I just uh, mentioned, we have a long and sordid history of human beings not being persons. And so it's really just this shorthand for the idea that you can have rights, they can collect in something, 
and you know, they can be adjudicated, they can be represented by a guardian or an attorney in court. And so, so when you ask for legal personhood, and indeed the, the uh, first anti-slavery cases, they were not going in and saying, hey, take this slave and make him a full citizen. No, it was just a very fundamental question of do you have the right not to be owned? Do you have the right to your most basic uh, and fundamental autonomy? Um, and that's, that's exactly the phrase, the, the word that the law uses. And autonomy for us is extremely important because we think about it, what is it? It's really your free will. Um, if, if I were to take any one of you and put you in a box, or if we can remember as being children put on time out, put in the corner, anyone who has an experience with having their free will frustrated knows that it sucks, and you'll do pretty much anything to avoid that. But also, anyone who's had an experience with a dog, a cat, even an insect, can also appreciate on some level that we are not the only beings who have an interest in our freedom, and, and indeed who find ways to object, sometimes forcibly, to any kind of deprivation. You can imagine your cat's claws coming out if you want to hug her. Well, no, she doesn't want you depriving of her, of her autonomy in that way, she, so she's going to, to make it known. And, you know, in, in very similar ways, science continues to tell us in unequivocal terms that we are not the only species that have a really deep appreciation for not only our own freedom, but our cultures and communities. So, for example, looking at elephants, um, they grieve over the bodies or the bones of their dead year after year. They'll return to the same places and pick up the bones of their dead relatives. And you can debate whether they're crying, but liquid runs down their eyes while they hold the bones. You know, it used to be a, um, in the days before Jane Goodall, who's a member of our board and has been obviously instrumental in, in bringing so many of these issues to the fore, it used to be the case, and I think a lot of folks can identify with this, that you would be almost automatically written off as soft-minded or anthropomorphic. You know, how dare you commit the cardinal scientific sin of reading you know, human emotions into a non-human animal. But I think now, with the help of so many scientists and so much work done in this area, it's now the inverse. You have to be anti-science to say that, for example, when an elephant picks up the bones of her dead year after year and goes out of her way to do it, you have to be an idiot to say that she's not mourning. I think, I think, we're at that point. And so with all of this in hand, with, with, with this legal history, with this evolving science, you might ask, well, what do you do? Um, so much, and certainly my own story, I think, and how I came to be at the Non-Human Rights Project, um, started with a frustration. This understanding that we have, we know that we're right, they know that we're right, we have all kinds of backup, but yet we're not getting the results that we want. We're running into this same wall, these same obstacles. And that what that means for the trillions of non-human animals that we use um, either directly or indirectly, um, often by taking their lives, what that means for them is even their most fundamental interests will never even be a blip on the screen, as it were, until we can start going in and at least having some of them be recognized as persons, right? And the other, I think, strength in, in going back to being practical in the sense is that we're not talking about every animal. You know, we don't even describe ourselves as an animal rights organization, in large part because what does that mean? You know, there's million species, half of them are beetles, and certainly the same rights shouldn't apply to all of them. So we really do, to go back off the Thomas Berry quote that we saw earlier, you know, it resonated, resonated with me very much because we talk about chimpanzee rights, we talk about elephant rights, we talk about orca rights. One day, um, as we can, you know, I hope, continue to progress, we'll get to the point where we can talk about cow rights and we can talk about chicken rights. Um, and on that note, I, I think I can, I can tuck in a little bit of, and I'm sure some folks might wonder, well, why these species? Why not my dog? Why not my cat? Uh, who gets to decide what, you know, um, what species are deserving of rights? And there's also, I think, a very um, important, um, you know, kind of line of opposition to, to, um, to deal with from the outset. This is not about, you know, uh, human-like intelligence or somehow privileging what we consider to be intelligence. In fact, in, from my opinion, that would really just repeat the sin, right? That, that the idea that we have all the answers and that we're somehow the gods that are just, you know, doling out these rights. No, rather, um, we have to, as much as possible, look at 
um, the science, right, the reality that tells us what is relevant to these beings, what rights are, you know, important to them. And so I see I have not much time left, so I want to put, uh, I want to end this on a, a positive note because really there's a lot to be positive, even here in, in the U.S. and in, in New York. Uh, they're not known for, you know, lighting the barn on fire with their animal rights activism, but um, after five years of these habeas corpus petitions on behalf of chimpanzees, um, just to summarize very quickly, the first appellate decision said, this is great and all, but you can't have rights if you're not capable of having corresponding duties. They say a person must have the capacity to take on rights and duties. I sent an email to Brian Garner, the editor-in-chief of Black's Law. He agreed to change that, so there's that, um, to, 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 rec to recognize that that, to recognize that you can have either or, because you don't need to have both, and you've never needed to have both. Um, so, long story short, and I left a couple of uh, copies of this, the highest court in the state of New York in May of this year, uh, I see I'm almost done, uh, issued an opinion in which it didn't recognize the personhood of the chimpanzees that were the parties, but it came as, almost as close as you can, as you can get, but more importantly, it gives us, we now have, you know, it took years and years and a stack of paper, I'm ashamed to say, very high. But what comes out on the other side is a judicial opinion that essentially says everything that we've been saying, but it's coming through a judge. So this is like, you know, the screenwriter who writes lines for, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, right? They suddenly mean something different because they're coming from a different source. And so I'll stop there and... Uh, Happy to answer any questions after. I'm going to stay here if that's okay, so I can see both my notes and you at the same time, which is increasingly becoming difficult. And I'm going to talk about science, so I desperately want the notes. But I want to start out by um, thanking Vermont Law School and saying that you're being extraordinarily modest um, in terms of your own contributions to rights of nature. The uh, Earth Law class at, at Vermont Law School was first proposed by Earth Law Center back in 2011. And when I started teaching it in 2012, um, there was a general like, oh, this is interesting, huh? And five years later, the class came in and like, yeah, we got this, so like, what's next? You know, it's, it's good. It, thank you so much for spreading the word. It's really made a, a huge difference. So um, I'd like to touch on a couple of questions today, um, really uh, in terms of how we translate this, this concept uh, that we're talking about, rights of nature, and the larger constitutional provisions that are in place and these broader laws into on the ground action, and how do we engage new stakeholder partners, new partners in this effort outside of this room, outside of the legal profession. We recognize that nature has rights, but once the laws are passed, we can't stop there. We have to act to make sure that they're implemented and they produce meaningful change. And there's a few ways to do that. Um, one that we've heard a lot about today um, is court action. And court action can be initiated by plaintiffs. And then we heard about today some courts, uh, the judges are taking up this cause of action on their own based on uh, precedents in New Zealand and elsewhere. So spreading the word again allows us to be able to raise awareness and change judicial activism. Um, the IUCN actually, the World Commission on Environmental Law, um, Catherine mentioned earlier, has a judicial education component to what they're doing. Um, and they adopted uh, an environmental rule of law declaration last year that specifically recognizes the rights of nature to exist, thrive, and evolve. Um, and so they're bringing that out to judicial education to try to spread the word. So the more we talk about this in terms of the discussions today and the writings afterward, the better. Um, it's really making change. Another implementation strategy is follow-up legislation. So you have, and this happens in you know, legislation generally, you have a very broad law, um, and then maybe you need follow-up laws uh, to be able to try to implement it. And one example of that occurred recently in Santa Monica, California, um, with uh, Shannon Biggs, um, who had to leave early today, and Earth Law Center's help. Uh, Santa Monica was able to pass a sustainability rights ordinance a couple years ago. Uh, and since then, local people in the community and city officials were trying to look at different ways to implement it. And in August, they succeeded 
in passing one of these follow-up laws, a local ordinance that bans new private groundwater wells and um, expansion of existing groundwater wells uh, held privately uh, from occurring in Santa Monica. Um, and in their sustainability rights ordinance, they recognize the rights of natural communities and ecosystems to flourish. And they specifically named the aquifer as one of these natural communities and ecosystems. So they cited this law in banning new private wells um, to try to protect the aquifer while they're developing a new uh, groundwater sustainability plan. So they recognized they needed to stop that. And they also recognized that they don't really have a lot of support coming from the state law, which is significantly weaker by comparison, not even sort of in the same universe of, of laws. So that's another, that's another tool that we can use, is passing follow-up laws to take a piece of the larger law and implement it and make it happen. Um, and so that's protecting the aquifer. Another legal implementation tool is administrative law, um, you know, which is regulations is sort of the shorthand term. And these like, regulations will help be more practical in guiding society. You wake up in the morning, you know, what do you do in a rights of nature world? You know, what kind of laws and regulations guide you in a very specific way? For example, when the city of Santa Monica develops its groundwater sustainability plan, it's going to have to figure out what the aquifer looks like now, you know, what the drawdown rate is, how many holes are being punched in it, what the rainfall is likely to be, et cetera, et cetera. And then they take all this information and they decide as a community what their plan is going to look like and how the aquifer is going to be used. And that's much more detailed than you can put in a law. And regulations are important in that regard. They help resolve inconsistencies in statutes and they fill gaps um, in language language that is often imprecise. And by talking about rights-based regulations, um, we help sharpen our own thinking about rights of nature. And, and in working on this particular area, um, I've found like I've, I've, I've come across a lot of questions that I hadn't thought of before. So it's been very helpful to me personally. So um, currently, you know, we have plenty of regulations. You know, those of you who are in law school now and who went to law school and took environmental law and are practicing um, know that environmental laws often call for healthy systems or some sort language in that regard. But, you know, as we were hearing earlier, you know, these are based in this larger property rights-based system. And so the details of the laws and the regulations that implement them assume that healthy means not too degraded that we can't keep using it. It doesn't actually mean that the system is truly healthy. For example, the Clean Water Act allows pollutant discharges with regular, comparatively few controls until there's a reasonable potential to actually violate standards. The Endangered Species Act doesn't protect the health of species populations. It doesn't really kick in until they're about to go extinct. So, you know, this is a very low bar for entry in terms of regulations. We want to try to raise that up. Um, so, but what does that look like? You know, if we had regulations in a rights of nature based world, you know, what would those regulations look like? It's easy in, in the Santa Monica case to say, okay, no private wells, but you can't say no to everything. You have to figure out how to have a relationship with the natural world and still be able to continue um, being humans in relationship. So to, to try to exemplify this a bit, you know, the, the, the Clean Water Act is something that I've worked with for a number of years, and so I'm using that as an example, a way for us to help start to deconstruct some of the assumptions in existing environmental laws that perpetuate harm, and then show how we can create a new legal system, a new regulatory system that's grounded in rights. So the Clean Water Act calls on us to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And then it, uh, it calls on the EPA to uh, initiate regulations in the form of water quality standards and other regulations um, that set goals for the relationship that we have with the water body, drive management actions, and guide enforcement. Um, Clean Water Acts, and this, this is getting a little bit nerdy now, gets nerdier later, so this, this is actually comparatively not too bad. Um, the water quality standards have three basic elements, the designated uses of the water body, water quality criteria to protect the uses, and an anti-degradation policy. Um, so let's go into these three and help dissect these assumptions. First, the designated uses are basically a laundry list um, of uses, so uh, mostly human uses, industrial, agricultural, municipal. Um, some um, natural uses, say for fish and such. Um, but it's pretty clear in the context of this overarching Clean Water Act focus on water to, as property to be degraded that inevitably, and what we're seeing today, is water quality is degraded because we've got a list and natural systems and protection of natural systems is just one piece of this larger list and we prioritize the human uses to the detriment of those. 
So uh, by contrast, a nature's rights approach to regulation and choosing designated uses would recognize up front that we have to protect the health of waterways in the first instance or we can't have effective, meaningful, and, and respectful human use of those waterways. So already we're seeing some disconnect um, and it's important to recognize the assumptions there. Um, jumping to the third element, the anti-degradation policy, um, it's supposed to protect existing uses of waterways and protect exceptionally clean waterways. But once again, there's an escape hatch because really it's, the Clean Water Act is designed for human use of waterways. And my own experience with years of Clean Water Act advocacy is that the anti-degradation policy that protects the downward slide of waterways um, is often just glossed over, the escape hatch is regularly used. Um, and that a rights-based approach would set a very different bar. Um, it would push us not only to try to protect existing health, but it would actually push us to restore waterways affirmatively before they're degraded. Um, and this is something that we often don't think about. We don't think about our duty to the environment to uh, redress what, the harm that we did in the past. So rights-based standards under anti-degradation would look completely different. It would force us to affirmative action to protect waterways. And then back to this, the sciencey bit, um, the second uh, element, which is criteria to protect the use of the waterway. Um, we, we focus on science and uh, criteria are science-based uh, standards that allow us to be able to use the waterway in a, in a way that um, under the Clean Water Act is sustainable, but under a rights-based approach would be you know, healthy. Um, but it's not just about science, it's also about values. Um, as one sympathetic ecosystem scientist said, scientists can elucidate how the system works, but values inform us about what's desired. And as we're seeing in deconstructing these assumptions, our values about waterways as property are driving where science goes and how science is used. And so we need to change those values and shape them in a different way and work with scientists to be able to develop something different, something more positive. So we're starting to answer these questions about what does a healthy system look like? What does a, a system that's protected by the rights of nature, the right to be healthy and flourish and thrive, what does that look like? Um, we're starting to answer questions, but there are challenges before us. We understand a lot more than we did in the past, but uh, you know, there's some steps that we need to do in order to try to push it a little bit further. And I'll offer a couple of approaches that scientists are looking at to say, what does this healthy ecosystem look like? You know, how do we even draw it on a map? Um, one is that, one approach is that a healthy ecosystem is something that's pristine or unaffected by humans. Sometimes this could be useful as a reference site. Sometimes, in some cases, it could be a policy goal, but eventually it's not going to be broadly applicable as a management tool because not only is pristine hard to define, but it takes people out of the picture, and I don't want to do that. Um, I want to develop what a relationship looks like. Um, so that's useful in some cases, but not all the time. Another approach that scientists are using is by comparing it to the human right to health. Remember, we don't say that we just have a right to exist. We like to think we have a right to thrive, too. Um, and the human right to health is an important goal, part of that overall goal. The World Health Organization, fortunately, has weighed in on this um, and provides us a little bit of guidance. One thing it says that human health is not is the absence of disease or infirmity. Well, you know, that's helpful because that's exactly how we judge environmental health to today. If it's not diseased and it's not infirm, then it must be healthy. Um, I don't think that's acceptable for my own health, so I don't think it's acceptable for the environment either. Um, our U.S. environmental laws basically say that a healthy ecosystem is something special and unique, um, like a scenic river or an standing national resource water or a national park. That's the exception, not the rule. It, that needs to be something that we think about on a regular basis. The World Health Organization also defines human health in a, in a systems context in an affirmative way. And it says that it's not just physical well-being, but the aggregation of physical, mental, and social well-being. So it's recognizing these relationships and starting to kind of stumble towards a, a broader definition where it recognizes our relationship with the environment. So another example, taking this a bit further, um, is scientists who are, are looking at these systems-based approaches and trying to apply them in specific ecosystems. So stream system scientists are looking at what they call distance from reference state of condition. And so a non-stressed system would be something close to what they expect a natural system to see, and there's a lot of scientists going into what that would look like. And a, non, and a stress system would be further away. Science, again, can show us what the system looks like, but we have to decide where we want to be on that. 
And then finally, um, other scientists, especially marine scientists, are sort of at the forefront of this because of a lot of funding and support in the marine science area. Um, they've been developing a more detailed, integrated understanding of ecosystem health, like the World Health Organization is trying to do. They're defining a healthy ecosystem as one that evolves and perpetuates itself within the context of its expected natural lifespan in the face of external stress. It's a mouthful, um, but you could break it down a little bit. Um, and what it basically says is that uh, it recognizes that not every natural system is going to flourish all the time, but healthy natural systems will change in expected ways. And so scientists can look for variations in the expected natural rate of change as an indicator of health. For example, accelerated extinction rates is telling us the system is not healthy. So there's another way to be able to start to look at that. And breaking that down even further, the scientists are looking at different elements, like we looked at um, physical, mental, and social health for human health. And they're looking at different ways to categorize ecosystem health, so again, to help them understand better. And, and just to emphasize, this is the margin of scientists. These are the, the people who are increasingly working in this area, but it's still not a lot of people working in this area because they, it's hard, it's hard work. Um, but uh, to get back, the healthy ecosystem is one that can maintain its structure and its function and its uh, resilience over time. And the structure refers to the ecosystem complexity, you know, the species richness, the interactions in the environment. Um, the function is the vigor, the energy, and the productivity of the system, like upwelling um, along the California coast, which brings nutrients up. Uh, to feed uh, species, uh, all kinds of different species. And then resilience is the ability of an ecosystem to bounce back from human stress uh, that we're increasingly placing on nature. So scientists are taking this ideas of organization and vigor or function and resilience as a way to sort of break down their thinking a little bit, but then integrate that all back together into a broader understanding of a healthy ecosystem, one that evolves and perpetuates itself within its expected natural lifespan in the face of external stress. And what does that mean for us, bringing back to lawyers, we need to reach out to scientists. Um, they're working, they're, they're sort of by themselves working and trying to see how their work can be relevant. And I think that it's important for us to learn from them and they can learn from us in partnership. Um, and as I noted at the start, implementation of rights of nature laws depends on us reaching out um, and developing these kinds of partnerships with people that we don't normally work with and that we can learn a lot from. Um, a couple of other essential partners to wrap up um, in this fight are the indigenous community, as we heard earlier. Um, indigenous wisdom includes the spiritual aspects of natural systems. For example, as embodied in the concept of Pachamama, Western science and indigenous understanding together will be key as we try to develop working systems of nature's rights laws. And then let's think again about reaching out to partners like uh, the finance community. Um, for example, Silicon Valley investor Tom Chi recently said that humans need to have a net positive relationship with the environment, and he is actively trying to guide investors to recognize that just as in any relationship, we need to care for nature, which means giving back more than we take. Um, and which is something that we can all agree with. And then finally, thanks to Stephen Marks for reminding us to reach out to politicians and recognizing that we too can become elected officials one day advocating for rights of nature. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna follow Linda's lead and stay at my seat because I have many notes in front of me and so I think it'll be easier. So what I'm going to do uh, for the last talk is uh, try to get us to think a little bit off Earth um, and think about how rights of nature might apply to outer space law and um, its ethical underpinnings. So you might be thinking, my goodness, there's so much work to be done here. It's massively challenging. Why, why take on something else that seems much more remote and distantly relevant? Um, well, one of the answers to that question is that the law is already in the process of being developed and not in a way that necessarily promotes the rights of nature. So in 2015, uh, very recalcitrant, uh, Congress, as you probably remember, unanimously passed the Commercial La Space Launch Competitive Act, which was 
um, short form known as the SPACE Act. And what the SPACE Act does is give individual corporations or persons, but mostly we're talking about corporations here, the right to have property interests in celestial bodies that they are capable of mining. Okay, So it does not give them the right to claim a celestial body itself. That would be inconsistent with the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which prohibits any nation or counterpart of any nation from having sovereignty over a um, natural object, okay? But it does allow in um, very familiar property terms, for those of you who have taken property, um, a bundle of rights type of metaphor for owning material extracted from asteroids and other celestial bodies. Um, and the words in the Space Act are that any individual who extracts this material can, quote, possess, own, transport, use, and sell it. Okay, so these are the familiar sticks in the bundle if you're using that metaphor. And it's very much a property-based individual right that's also based on exclusivity. So who's ever first in time and capable of extracting this material has exclusive rights to it, quote again from the Space Act, free from f harmful interference. So it's an exclusivity model and it's also a first in time model. So you say, well, that's very abstract and it's really far off in the future. Well, no, there are two uh, Silicon Valley offshoot companies that are actually in the process of getting ready to mine celestial bodies. One of them is uh, planetary resources and the other is deep space industries. I won't get into their uh, goals of using this material, uh, except to say that Deep Space Industries has more of an in situ um, uh, process planned and um, uh, planetary resources actually plans to extract material and possibly even bring it back to Earth. Okay, so the uh, planetary resources expects by 2025 to be able to actually begin to mine asteroids and other celestial bodies. And they, of course, were one of the biggest proponents for the Space Act, because this is enabling legislation that secures their interest. Um, and so they've already been in the process of selling, se sending drone-like space ve vehicles with telescopic technology to scout out which near-Earth asteroids are going to be accessible and which ones might have value. So this is already underway, okay? Now, um, I think this is a huge missed opportunity, um, and the idea of taking a very traditional property framework from very old law on discovery and um, uh, other very old American property law and just imposing it in an outer space context is uh, legally problematic as well as seriously ethically problematic. Um, and so from a legal point of view, we are a signatory of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. And I won't get into a lot of the details, but that was a, a Cold War treaty that really was designed to promote international peace in the exploration of space. And that is the treaty that said no country or counterpart of a country can claim sovereignty in any space celestial object um, and didn't really address the ability to use 
space or uh, <laughs> garner private property from space. But it did say that this should be a united project where all countries, even those who don't have the capital to engage in exploration of space, should be the mutual beneficiaries. So here we have our Congress unilaterally giving US companies and US individuals the right to property in space and completely ignoring the Outer Space Treaty commitment to mutual benefit and the need to explore space and make it uh, beneficial for all countries. Um, and so I, that's really a treaty issue that I don't want to get into in a great deal of detail, but I do think that this move on the part of Congress does violate the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and right now there's a, the, the House passed a bill last April that said the Outer Space Treaty will be satisfied because they're delegating this job of regulating space mining to the Department of Commerce and the space department within the Department of Commerce, which will certify every project as consistent with the Outer Space Treaty. There's nothing in this legislation that says how they will do that. It just says we will do this. And there's a presumption that if you apply for one of these uh, certificates, that you will get it. Okay. And there's language in the legislation that also says this will be um, the uh, forefront of the U.S. in the 21st century taking the lead in the ownership of space resources. Okay, so um, this is happening very rapidly, and unless somebody takes a hard look at it, this will spread. Uh, there's other countries already, Luxembourg, um, trying to model property rights on the same type of legislation. Okay, so um, I think that uh, developing a space ethic that recognizes the rights of nature is a natural extension of what theologian Thomas Berry talked about. Uh, he talked about the commonality of all things in the solar system, including the common origin of the solar system, the um, composition of all things in the solar system as um, being composed of the same carbonaceous and other material. Okay, so he did not talk about a space ethic, but I think it would have been a natural extension to have done that. So um, what I'd like to do now is look at some of the obstacles to developing a new space ethic and space law accordingly. Okay, so the first one is that we've got massive problems on Earth. Al Gore talked about the bone weariness of the damned um, when he said people are so overwhelmed by environmental problems that they feel discouraged, okay? And so there's a realistic concern taking us out of the sphere of Earth and developing rights of nature um, off Earth. And that, I, I would argue, is the response to that is that this is a real, really new opportunity to create a, a rights of nature framework that might be very valuable here on Earth as well. And in a, in a sense, it's a tabula rasa in that new law could be developed that would set uh, the stage for new law on Earth. So another problem is that environmental law has in recent years gone very much toward a place-based approach. Um, Bioregionalism is one ethic that does that, but also many environmentalists have talked about the connection 
that people have to have to their actual world and actual place. And here we are expanding something that, uh, to which we have no clear connection and seems very, very abstract. And we're not actually talking about finding life in our solar system because the conclusion to date is that we're not likely to run into ET anytime soon. If we find something, it will be information about the origins of life embedded on other planets and on celestial objects. So how to create a connection um, to outer space uh, without having a place-based relationship. Um, and it's, I would just like to use one example of how um, the Kiowa Indians have taken a story about the origin of the uh, Devil's Tower Monument in uh, Wyoming, also called Bears uh, Butte, and related the origin story not only to Earth, but to space. So um, the story goes, eight children were there at play, seven sisters and their brother. And suddenly the boy was struck dumb. He trembled and began to run his hands and feet. His fingers became claws and his body was covered with fur. Directly there was a bear where the boy had been. The sisters were terrified, they ran, and the bear ran after them. They came to the stump of a great tree, and the tree spoke to them. It bade them climb upon it, and as they did so, it began to rise into the air. The bear came to kill them, but they were just beyond its reach. It reared against the tree, scored the bark all around with its claws, and the seven sisters were born into the sky and they became the stars of the Big Dipper. So um, that's a Native American legend that just shows how there can be a concrete kinship with the universe as a whole um, beyond Earth itself. So I think that although there are some great abstractions involved with the space-based ethic, there's also potential over time to uh, have a place-based approach and a sense of connection, okay? One other obstacle <clears throat> is that environmental ethics on Earth is life-oriented. Okay, and we are talking about objects that are some people's view of the epitome of inanimate objects, dead rocks, okay? Asteroids do not have inhabitants um, and they do not have uh, biologically based ecosystems. They're simply rocks. So we have to begin to think about how we're going to value the inanimate part of the universe as well as living things if we are to develop a law and ethic that takes into account the values of outer space. Um, and there are um, attempts to do that, and um, but it, it's going to be challenging because it's going to move us away from a life-centered approach to law and ethics. So I see I'm out of time, but um, I just wanted to give you the flavor of what's happening and the possible future here and to urge people to start thinking about Earth ethics in an expanded way to consider the universe as a whole and how our explorations that are currently underway and will take place in the future need to be uh, governed by some principles. And I think the principles of the rights of nature should be the appropriate model. So thank you. Fascinating. 
So we have some time for some Q&A before we wrap up for the day. <laughs> Who has questions? I can kick us off. Um, my question is for Thomas. Um, interesting to think about um, the, the absence of the ability of, of many of our existing laws to stop things. Um, I'm, I can attest to that, having worked on a 10-year NEPA case that ended with a facility that's currently operating just fine. Um, I wondered about zoning, because in my experience of, of trying to try lots of different legal strategies for things to stop projects, sometimes turning to land use, sometimes turning to zoning, um, inability to get a special permit or a variance, things like that, is something that I think of as being able to stop a project. I wondered if you could talk about why that may or may not work in this context. Yeah, so we, we had a 12-year NEPA case, so I feel your pain on that. Um, as for using zoning, zoning is about separating out incompatible land uses, industrial from commercial, commercial from residential. When you use zoning, when you do out zoning uh, to attempt to ban within all zones in a municipality, you're subject to the same kinds of constitutional lawsuits that you're subjected to by the corporation if you attempt to ban something outright. So due process rights of the corporation, it all comes back to corporate personhood. Sometimes we see that as a 30,000 foot thing, you know, that corporations are persons, so what, what does that have to do with me? Well, the very real place where the rubber hits the road is in these lawsuits where the corporation files these constitutional claims based on their status as a person, which gives them due process, equal protection, Fourth Amendment, unreasonable search and seizure rights, you know, Walmart has the, first, the same kind of First Amendment free speech protections that you have, uh, and they're greatly exaggerated because of the wealth that backs companies like Walmart. So, uh, unfortunately, the land use planning tools, when you use them for purposes that they were never intended to be used for, which is as outright bans within a municipality, then you get the same kinds of lawsuits against the municipality that you would if you had just passed a ban in the first place. Kind of. And another question. Um, when you were talking about the different uh, legal strategies that corporations have used to oppose these types of municipal bans, you mentioned how um, the millions and dollars of damages that can pile up, um, which seems as though it would certainly have a chilling effect on communities seeking to pass these bans. I wondered if you could speak to any examples where you've seen that play out or where communities actually have been hit with those kinds of damages. Um, yes, yeah, so very much so. So when you get the complaints in, uh, they're, they're all template complaints because the corporate lawyers all talk to each other and they have the same claims. And so for 100 years, over 100 years, they've built these claims to be able to file them. So when you see a complaint, they're always filed in federal court, so they don't bother with the state courts because they want to get rid of any state bias that there might be, so they lift them out to the federal courts. And that also gets them further away from the municipality that passed the law. So you get more insulation because you're driven into the federal courts. And we sometimes forget, but the federal courts were the ones that bestowed constitutional rights on corporations. So it was the federal courts that declared that corporations were persons under the law. So the federal courts have a long history of doing that kind of thing. And I, I guess more to, the, more to the point, most municipalities repeal their laws. Because if you're a municipal elected official and you're looking at a $10 million, $100 million lawsuit coming in the door plus attorney's fees, you run for the hills. I mean, that's, that's why nothing gets done. I mean, no real activism gets done through municipal lawmaking at this point, and that's why, because people run for the hills. And the corporate boys, just to finish that out, a very real life example, the corporations are now going after you. They're going after the lawyers who represent the municipalities to try to stop these projects. So last year, I and a co-counsel got hit with a $52,000 sanction award from a federal judge who said it was sanctionable to argue that a community had a constitutional right of local self-government to decide to stop a project from coming in. And she, as a sidehand flick in the opinion, uh, almost went after the lawyer who did the rights of nature argument. So here's an ordinance, you know, a law was passed that recognizes that nature has rights within the municipality. A lawyer attempts to then use the ordinance and she said, that's probably sanctionable as well. 
So I think the, 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 some of the problem with these symposiums sometimes is that we make it look easy, you know, people make it look easy. Oh, rights of nature is a great idea, let's put it into place. And then, hey, as lawyers, let's enforce it. No, the, the system is such that it is so hard to open up these portals and so hard for one community to get through them that number one, we should expect that repercussion, those repercussions. It's not gonna be easy. You're up against a thousand years of property law, literally. And so this stuff is very hard. Uh, it's, and people use the word movement for rights of nature stuff. It's really not a movement yet, I don't think. It's pockets of people trying to come up with new, new strategies and new tactics. But we need to expect that smackdown because that's what, that's what happens. Absolutely. What a great thing to hear in a law school. I think that's an important thing to know. It's part of, it's part of what this work is about. Um, I'll ask one more question. Um, this one's for Linda. I was interested in the concept of utilizing the regulatory process for developing these um, personhood protections. I wondered what the ramifications might be of working that into a regulation where the um, statute declaring the need for regulations doesn't recognize that that um, right of personhood. Um, whether that could come back, blow back on the agency that is responsible for complying with that statute, is is it possible to do it in a regulation if it, if the statute itself doesn't do it? Well, uh, I don't. Usually, the regulations are are developed in response to the direction of the statute. So it would be, uh, one, it would be sort of practically difficult to pass regulations consistent with the statute if the statute didn't call for it. But then also as, uh, you know, it's just a lar on a larger basis, you know, we're seeing that, you know, it's even though the Clean Water Act called for the, you know, physical, biological, and chemical integrity of the nation's waters, because it's embedded within this larger construct, this larger framework of water as property, uh, it's, you know, conceptually it's hard to pass regulations that actually would implement that because the, the system isn't set up for that. Right. So the, there's just, it, in fact, we don't even recognize, you know, I did environmental advocacy for many years without even thinking that these assumptions, of, thinking about the assumptions they were making, let alone like maybe they're wrong and maybe they're different assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, but deconstructing that and understanding how the system actually works is, is critical to see yeah. that you, you need to, take these concepts and, and drive them forward in different ways, but trying to drive them within the existing system is, is gonna fail. Right. Other questions? Don't be shy. Yes. Um, so my question is for Kevin. I was wondering with the cases that you bring with the non-human rights project, or I guess better yet said the um, habeas corpus petitions that you file, um, is there any type of judgment that goes into the types of courts that you file those with? And also, um, I guess, what do you look for in the different um, animals that you file with? I know you said um, there's a reason why you pick like chimpanzees, elephants, and killer whales, but are there particular situations these animals are living in that um, give rise to these petitions? Sure, that's a good, I guess uh, just if you could clarify the first um, question about whether there are judgments that come from these courts? Um, I was just wondering how you choose the courts that you file. Oh, sure, sure. So um, we kind of worked a little bit backwards in a sense. Like most folks, I think, respond to a specific, particularly in the animal world, right? There's, say, for example, a notorious roadside circus that's been abusing an elephant or mistreating an elephant, for example, for decades, right? And a lot of people know about that. Um, those can make, you know, sympathetic cases. But something that we have to make very clear from the outset in all of our cases, in part because there's so much law and I, I guess almost paternalistic thinking that we're so used to doing about animals, you have to make it very clear that it's not about welfare. In the same way that a, if, if you're locked up in prison and you file a habeas or you're locked up arbitrarily, uh, it's not about your welfare, you just wanna get the hell out. You know, They might say, well, what if we make your pillow softer? You'd say, well, who cares? You don't have a right to, you know? So it, it, it does, there's a real tendency and a, a danger of uh, confusing those issues. But um, to go to you know, how we chose the state, um, so <clears throat> I mentioned the common law. 
Habeas corpus is super important to us because it's one of the few, very few areas remaining um, in the US where you can actually get access to the common law. And what that means in practice, it's the same judge, it's just that you're bringing, instead of a typical kind of commercial matter uh, or any kind of civil matter that would come before them, it would be governed by a statute or you know um, case law. Um, they're instead asked to sit as a common law judge and a lot of the judges aren't used to that, and frankly, we've seen, I've seen firsthand judges who want to do the right thing, but they're clearly fearful of upsetting a, a much larger system, right? So they, their fear of uh, being, um, you know, that, that one judge who is, you know, 100 years from now, they look back on, in scorn, like, yeah, he's the reason we all have to be vegan, because he made a chimpanzee a person. You know, there is this sort of fear that that's, um, and that kind of segues, I think, into your other question. is like, how do we choose these species? So um, we, again, we go back to the drawing board. We don't, we don't advance the arguments that resonate with us personally. We look at the common law. What, what do judges claim to care about? And um, I think f foremost among those things in the US are equality, um, liberty, but uh, more to the point for us is this idea of autonomy. And um, I think I mentioned, you know, we have a short list, and I'm sure if you, it, it, these are kind of fuzzy concepts, right? We can talk all day about what constitutes autonomy, but uh, for us, it's a, you know, level of, of it's really an amalgamation of, of observations of scientific facts that make very clear that uh, these species value their autonomy as much as we do. And for that reason, we go to these common law courts and say, look, you have a being before you who is autonomous, who is being deprived of her liberty in every, you know, meaningful way. By the way, she's not human, but, you know, as we've seen and, and fought, through, fought these through, that's really all that the judges can come up with. When you present them with this mountain of stuff, they can only really fall back on this human exceptionalism to say, well, this is nice, we should treat them okay, much the same way we treat environmental law. Be nice to it, but it's there for us. X put it there for us, God put it there for us, whoever put it there for us, it doesn't really matter. The fundamental kind of human exceptionalism remains. Um, but we also have to be pragmatic, right? So while it might be the, tr the fact for me that I got into this work f because of, I was drawn in because of these very large scale abuses, you think about you know, fishing and agricultural, uh, you know, industrial raising of animals for food. Um, we can't expect to politically or legally go and, and make these kinds of arguments that we're making for chimpanzees about cows and chickens. I think personally that we'll have to, um, you know, technology and other factors will force down the consumption of these animals to a point where we can then start thinking about their rights. Me personally, I don't think it makes sense to talk about rights for a chicken because they're still being eaten by most people, including the judges that you're talking to. Uh, people aren't eating chimpanzees in the US, they're not eating elephants, and we can also look at them and just, it's just undeniable that, um, you know, you can, some people still debate, I think it's, it's really their gut that it allow, fails, uh, prevents them from seeing, say, the personality of a pig, but we have to be, you know, somewhat pragmatic in how we, and again, it goes back to these are, science tells us these are autonomous beings, deal with it, judge. Thank you. Can I ask? A follow-up question on the choice of species. I've taken this up with Steve also. Um, the species that you have selected have many capacities that are shared with humans. Um, and I'm wondering if you think a personhood pro approach, and you started to address this with farm animals, has kind of a dead end built into it when you're talking about invertebrates and other kinds of animals that don't have human-like capacities and have actually great diversity from humans, uh, for example, reptiles. Um, and do you think that the personhood approach is just a first stage but has that built-in limitation? Or do you plan over time to try to expand the personhood approach to other kinds of animals, non-mammals, for example? So the second one, and um, it's a really great question, and I should say, um, none, we don't pretend any of this is perfect, right? We didn't invent this personhood. 
we could take it or leave it, but the fact is that it's there right. and we have to utilize it. But the beauty of, and I, I spoke briefly about this concurring opinion that we got in May, um, the beauty of that to me is that it endorses kind of a lot of the foundation of it. And the foundation of it is applicable, if, for example, the, the opinion, you know, the judge said that you know, the issue of whether a chimpanzee is entitled to habeas you know, speaks to the relationship to all the life around us. So there is this recognition, I think, among jurists and others who really get it, that um, this is kind of a road in. And look, we're kind of being cute as lawyers, right? We're making an argument that they have to take seriously, that they can't just wiggle their way from. But my hope, and certainly our plans, um, is that you know, this is kind of a cauldron, right? That we get the courts in this very almost contrived circumstance captivity to endorse these ideas, but then going forward, it enters the legislative process, and there you're not limited at all. A legislature could, in theory, make any being a person, we think and argue. Um, it's just that, you know, all those political factors and everything else gets in the way. But, you know, we really say, I really do believe that this is, um, it's, it's a punch through the wall, right? And that it, hopefully things um, will follow from that. To you, oh, am I on? Hello. Yes. Um, so one of the things that uh, piqued my interest when you're talking about the space mining is rare earth metals is yes. the subject of horrible strip mining right now. Yes. We're just tearing apart mountains. And um, do you see, based on what you know from these corporations, is that going to alleviate some of that uh, destruction of, of the earth? Well, they say so, mm -hmm. and they also say that it will uh, go toward eliminating some of the horrific conflict, say, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. involves villages that are ravaged, that happen to be on the way to mining areas. Um, so these are two of the arguments that they present, um, and there is some truth to that. Uh, an asteroid is a very low gravity, if nil gravity, environment. And so to extract materials from an asteroid, you're talking about extracting at the surface. Whereas if you're talking about earth mining, you're talking about the core of the earth because the very same materials sunk through gravity to the Earth's core. Um, the problem is the methodologies that these companies are talking about are so far really invasive and very conflict promoting, not conflict in the sense of the democratic con Congo, but conflict promoting in terms of fights with various miners about who owns what. So just to give you two examples, one approach is to lasso smaller asteroid and then to, um, once tethered to the asteroid, land on it, okay, and then start mining. Um, and so once you do that approach, how does somebody else try to mine on the same asteroid? You can't possess the entire asteroid because that would be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty. So what happens um, when you have two miners using similar methodologies to extract? Another methodology, just briefly, is harpooning the asteroid and taking a trial and error approach to see when you've hit a viable area. Well, you can imagine how, what conflicts might arise out of that if some company, say Deep Space Industries, is already mining, and then somebody else sends a trial and error harpoon and hits the same area, then the United States federal courts are charged with the jurisdiction over deciding those disputes. And query, how can a federal court decide a property dispute over property that no one owns? Um, and why should US courts be the um, authority on when a conflict has occurred? So there's many, many problems with mining off Earth. Also, there's the problem of forward contamination. So some asteroids are, are 
treated as the cradle of nature because they contain very important material that um, explains how the universe and humans might have been created. Um, and damage to dead rocks um, is really not damage without significance because we might be missing some really important scientific information that could be obtained. Um, and, and so there's also, as far as bringing things back to Earth, there's the forward contamination issue of what if we bring microbial substances that we don't know exist back to Earth and that creates some contamination. So there are also um, environmental issues of, in fact, really great significance because we know so little about the solar system and how different bodies within the so solar system interrelate um, apart from how little we know about the bodies themselves. So um, I think that there's, this is not without some real environmental risks. Your, your comment about contamination, I think, is of particular concern. I have a client, a uh, mild-mannered newspaper reporter, as a matter of fact, who's very concerned about kryptonite coming back to Earth, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're not Superman fans. <laughs> I think we can do one more question. Go ahead. Um, I have a question, I think, for the panel in general, maybe for Mr. Lindsay specifically. Um, Grant Wilson earlier was talking about sort of how we should get involved any way that we can. Um, and we talk about the rights of nature being sort of the next paradigm of environmental law. Uh, in the interest of this, I mean, this being Vermont Law School, a lot of people here maybe going to be traditional environmental lawyers. How do you see that we can? work for uh, the goals of the rights of rights of nature if we're not, I mean, is it all or nothing? We either have to be, you know, all about rights of nature and that's what our whole, our whole focus is, our whole practice, or are there ways that we can be traditional environmental lawyers and implement a lot of this stuff, you know, in, either in our language or in, uh, you know, uh, amended pleading or, you know, how, how can we uh, sort of do both? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's a drop in the bucket, but we just hired a VLS graduate, Kira Kelly, who's back there, yes. And she will become our New Hampshire counsel for some of the work. Um, my response has varied over the years, but basically, uh, just going to be blunt, when kids come to me and say, you know, I'm going to law school, uh, how should I best use that to get out and do the kind of work that Seldef does? And First thing I say is don't go to law school. I mean, that's <laughs> blunt, but uh, if I had to do it again, I'm not sure I would because lawyers don't build movements. I mean, lawyers can help movements build, but this thing that we're talking about, it's a 20, 30, 40 year arc of movement stuff that we're talking about. And the only way to get the sufficient a number of people to make that force happen is to have 5,000 communities across the United States who say, I'm giving up on this existing system while I'm going to do something else. And they need the lawyers to do that, uh, which brings me to my second answer, which is you really got to form your own group organization. I mean, that's what we did, formed our own group and then went to work for it. Uh, but there's no major environmental organization that supports rights of nature at this point. Their environmental regulatory stuff and enforcing the same old paradigm. In fact, they openly oppose rights of nature. I've been in rooms with them. You know, a letter came into the city of Pittsburgh 24 hours before they passed the rights of nature law saying, don't pass this, it's unconstitutional, illegal, and you're interfering with the environmental regulatory stuff. And in Ecuador, we had major environmental organizations in Ecuador, Hugo knows the story, who buttonholed us 24 hours before the language was going to go into the draft constitution telling us to drop it or help help you know the folks who were in charge of the drafting stuff to drop the language. And it may seem counterintuitive to us, but there's a huge environmental law industry out there that's focused on regulatory stuff and the existing laws it is. And they're almost as big a problem as the corporations that come in to do X, Y, and Z to the communities. So again, that's a blunt assessment, but my shorthand answer is got to create your own group. And if you can latch up with some of these existing organizations who need lawyers, like the California folks, they need lawyers, and then try to do it part-time because 
there's no jobs really out there except for one of the nascent groups that's currently doing rights of nature stuff, but that's still so small, it's tough to count on that. I would just say if you're working as an environmental lawyer, we were talking before about courageous judges. Well, when you draft a complaint, include a cause of action for the rights of nature, and you can do multiple pleadings. They don't have to be consistent. Try it and see if you can persuade a court to be sympathetic, and that's how, over time, the law may change. And, and I would add, since we're in a law school, you know, publish. Uh, it, it seems like it, it doesn't really do that much, especially in the states. But you know, when I first start, started, when the light bulb went on for me, I started thinking, well, there must be somebody who wrote on this, and I just wasn't, you know, finding much of anything. And I noticed, though, in Sierra Club v. Morton, you know, he relied on a published legal opinion, Christopher Stone's opinion, in his dissent, to be able to. Uh, you know, argue his point. And also in other countries, you know, judges in other countries may rely and use heavily legal journal articles, especially, you know, prestigious ones. And so you may think it may not matter so much, but, you know, we've talked a lot about Ecuador today and it's influenced a lot of people. New Zealand has, you know, people take these ideas where they can get them. So that's something anybody here could do, you know, just get the word out, start publishing it. And at least it, it, it may make a difference that you may not know. So if, if, you, if you don't do anything, you could at least do that. Just one one last note. I think what we're looking at is really an organized revolt. I mean, that's what's happening, is communities who are saying, we're not going to do this anymore. And it's a revolt that has on its backs survival. I mean, it's a crisis moment. Sometimes we don't feel it, but uh, it's a crisis moment. This is make or break. And without some new body of law coming along, without rewriting or amending the federal constitution, which I think is eventually what needs to happen. We have a federal constitution that was written in the 1780s. It's archaic. You know, the Bill of Rights is great, but the rest of the text of the constitution is all about property protection because the founders hated you. They thought you were the mob, and so they wrote it specifically to contain you, and it's worked. So if you want a rights and nature constitution, you gotta rewrite the thing, and I think that's part of the arc this journey that has to happen. And with that, <laughs> that is the end of our panels for today. Thank you so much for our panelists. We're gonna have some closing remarks before we wrap up. And to um, elaborate on what Linda Sheehan said about um, publishing, we do have a couple of articles that we picked that are rights of nature based. We didn't print very many of them because they're huge and we're trying to be environmental, uh, but we love to send things electronically. So if you would like some more background and to read some of the literature um, that's been recently published, we have a sign up sheet on the side table here. The authors are Hauk and Lilo, you can ask for both and uh, just write legibly your email address and we're happy to send those if you'd like to do a little bit more reading. Okay. Yeah. Or if you're interested in publishing with BGL or something along those lines, we do have the White River Writing Competition coming up um, in December. So um, maybe pick a rights or a nature topic or something like that. Um, open, but we just wanna let you know about that coming up soon. Um, so, as a quick recap, um, today we've discussed what rights natural entities um, already possess, language from around the world that recognizes the rights of nature, the role of and the call for responsibility as the invisible twin to rights, successful rights of nature cases from around the world, how rights of nature is used in communities to push back against industrial development, the link between indigenous knowledge and rights of nature, the extension of legal personhood to animals and the rights of nature in space. It's been a very exciting discussion. Um, I know that we've enjoyed it and are taking a lot with us and I hope that you are as well. Um, also, before we end, we would be remiss if we didn't thank just a few additional people. Um, so we wanna thank, first of all, one more time, all of the speakers and all of the moderators who traveled from near and far to be here today. We had people coming from the west coast of the country, people coming from as far south as Florida, and then several speakers coming from different countries. So thank you again. Give them a round of applause, please. Um, 
in addition, we also wish to thank our awesome faculty advisor, John Echevarria. Um, we wish to thank a few different professors who we've met with in creating this symposium to really get a good idea of what to include. Um, we'd like to thank Hilary Hoffman, Pat Parencho, David Mears, um, Reed Loader, and Melissa Scanlon and the New Law New Economy Law Center. Um, also, as far as logistics go, we would like to thank Martina, Chef Jeff, and the entire cafe staff for a wonderful lunch today. Karen Henderson, Ben Jervy, Bill Bond, Katie Merrill, Gordon Boddington, and additionally, our symposium committee. Thank you for all of your tireless work on this. We couldn't have done this without you. And also the entire VGL staff. Thank you for all of your incredible work on production and also on the symposium. Um, one last note, after this, we are having a reception in Yates Common Room um, beginning right about now. And we'd like to extend the invitation to everyone in the room to come join us. We will have some very light refreshments and drinks, um, but it's a way to kind of get a little bit more time in to maybe follow up some loose threads that we have with this discussion. And that being said, um, in any case, just keep the conversation going. Um, make sure that you leave today with this in your mind and be sure to bring this up when you find the opportunity and do something. <laughs> That's what we ask of you. So I hope you enjoyed today. Thank you so much for attending. And as two last housekeeping notes, um, one, if you have CLE forms, please return them to the table outside from which you got them. And also, please return your name tags so that we can reuse the plastic portion. Thank you. <laughs>